Hi! Welcome to this part of my review featuring Farthest Star. Farthest Star is a competitive skirmish game, a science fiction game, but it's also a role-playing game, and it's a solo skirmish game as well. It is many things at once. If you haven't seen the other parts of my review, please check out the playlist in the description below. This time we are going to talk about actions and combat and other mechanics. And I also wanted to inform you that Farthest Star is now available as a physical book. You can check out the links in the description below as well. So let's get started. Actions and combat. As a skirmish game, Farthest Star involves battles between relatively small numbers of model figures per side. Crews will range in size between 2 to 7 models. When you play the scenarios from chapter 4 in this book, each one will offer suggestions for the type and number of models your crew might face. This becomes especially important for solo and co-op games. When it comes to the combat round, like most miniature games, Farthest Star features a specific sequence of events that helps to organize the tabletop action. We call this sequence the combat round. The combat round breaks down into two phases, initiative and taking turns. A round consists of a number of turns equal to the number of models involved in the battle. Each model gets a turn to activate. During phase 1 initiative, you need to use a standard deck of 52 playing cards minus the jokers, and every character usually receives one card to determine initiative. This includes player characters and AI-controlled game characters. Each round you will deal cards from the deck to each character, dealing cards face up and determining turn order by the value of each card, and you break any ties by comparing the suits of the cards. Traits like Chosen and Enhanced Senses can grant a character an extra card on initiative. You can see those trait descriptions for specifics on what benefits the extra card grants to the character in the relevant section. Sometimes it will allow the characters to take the better of the two, that is the two cards, and sometimes it may grant them a second turn that round, one on each card. At the end of the round, you place all of the current initiative cards into a discard pile next to the card deck. When it comes to reshuffling, you will reshuffle the initiative deck once you've dealt out your last card. Simply pick up the discard pile and shuffle it vigorously. Once you're satisfied you've gotten a good shuffle, you finish dealing out initiative cards and move on to phase 2 of the turn. Now, when it comes to phase 2, this phase usually consists of a number of turns equal to the number of models involved in the battle, but certain traits can add a second turn for a specific character. In this phase, each model takes a turn and performs a number of actions. There are five types of actions in Farthest Star. Move, Free, Combat, Reaction and Special. Models may perform one move action, and either one special or one combat action per turn. Models may perform up to three free actions, and reactions often occur as a result of some other condition outside of the normal turn order. When it comes to move actions, every model in Farthest Star gets a move action during its turn. Models normally move six inches. A model may split this up over the course of its turn interspersing this movement with the performance of other actions, including combat. Now, when it comes to measuring and base combat, players measure all movement in Farthest Star in inches. If you're using 10mm or 15mm miniatures, you can have any listed ranges or movement rates. Players should measure movement from the edge of the model's base to the edge of an opposing model's base in the case of measuring distances for melee and ranged combat. Base contact occurs when one model's base touches another model's base, of course. This is normally the only way enemy models may fight in melee. Now concerning zone of control, models cannot move through the space occupied by enemy models. Every model in the game has a 1 inch area all around it, we refer to as its zone of control. If a model moves within an enemy model's zone of control, all movement stops and the two models enter into melee combat. You place them in base contact. Models may move through friendly models and ignore their zones of control. 
but models must end their movement in an area large enough to accommodate their base size without sitting atop another model's base. When it comes to pre-measuring, players may always pre-measure distances before, after or during a model's move. Concerning facing, we assume all models can see 360 degrees around themselves. They are quite perceptive of their surroundings. Now concerning difficult ground, muddy fields, shallow water and uneven terrain can slow a model down. Models moving through areas designated as difficult ground have whatever portion of their movement that occurs in the difficult area. Now when it comes to being knocked down and standing up, models in Farthest Star will sometimes find themselves knocked down for one reason or another. Models that are knocked down must spend one inch of their move action to stand up. Models attacking a knocked down model enjoy a bonus to close combat attacks, but knocked down models or crawling models enjoy a bonus to their defense goal rolls against ranged attacks. Now concerning other types of movement, characters have several other types of movement available to them. This count towards the character's total move allowance for their turn. So you can climb, crawl, jump, everything with their own uh, particulars and specific details. You can even swim. Now when it comes to free actions, they require little time to complete and usually involve the model trying to quickly sense its surroundings. There are two major types of free actions anyone can do, but certain special traits might require a free action. So you have perception checks that come into play when you need to spot a hidden or out of sight model or a hidden objective, you could also drop prone to get that bonus, that defensive advantage when the opponents are shooting at you. Now when it comes to special actions, these are actions that cover a wide variety of options on the tabletop, like opening and forcing doors, hiding, using items or picking up objects, using traits and such. Now let's go deeper into combat. Farthest Star primarily features two types of combat, melee and ranged. Both involve opposed goal roles. A model may expand its combat action to do one of the two, but not both. In this game, an attack goal role can represent both a single well-aimed blow or a flurry of shots or swings. If you're playing a player versus player game, each player gathers their dice pool and rolls. Decide whether to use rerolls and then announce your goal totals. When playing solo or co-op games, you're going to employ the combined role as explained in part 1 of this review. You will designate a specific dice color for your rolls and a different one for the rolls of the AI game models. You determine the size of each dice pool and you roll all the dice together. Then you separate out your character's goals scored from those scored by the AI model because of the different uh, color dice. When it comes to choosing targets, when you choose whom to attack, a model may target any legal enemy model. An unengaged model may target any model it can see with a ranged attack, and a model engaged in melee may target any legal foe it can reach with a close combat attack. Now let's talk more about melee combat. Melee combat requires combatants to be in base contact. A model who wants to make a melee attack moves within their target's 1 inch zone of control. That brings them into base contact. They then use their combat action to attack. The attacking model in melee rolls its MA versus the defender's MD. That is the melee attack versus the melee defense. Be sure to factor any extra dice and rerolls from gear or situational modifiers. If the attacker gets more goals than the defender, they have a hit, and the difference between the goals scored on the attack check and the goals scored on the defense check equals the health loss inflicted by the attack. If the defender ties or gets more goals than the attacker, they have fought them off. Now when it comes to breaking from melee, a model can move out of a melee but its opponent can launch an immediate free attack on the escaping model. This attack is still opposed as it is assumed that the model breaking from combat is making a fighting withdrawal from combat. If it's fighting multiple opponents, each one gets a free attack versus a single defense goal roll. Even if the model breaking from combat suffers health loss, 
it can still get away, as long as it does not suffer a knockout. If a model attacks and damages a foe, then breaks from melee that same round, the foe damaged by its attack does not get the normal free attack on the model breaking from combat. Now when it comes to multiple foes in melee, models ganging up on a single defender gain a number of bonus attack and defense dice based on their numerical advantage. If two models were attacking one model, each of the attacking models would gain a bonus to their attack rolls. If on a later turn a third model rushed in, all three allied models would gain an even greater bonus to their attacks for the 3 to 1 advantage, so it scales. Models with a numerical advantage in melee may break away without suffering the normal penalty for breaking from melee. Now, concerning aid in melee, when a friendly model rushes in to help a comrade assailed by multiple foes, it engages one of the enemy models, and a separate melee ensues. Keeping them in base contact, move the two models 1.5 inches away from the original close combat. Now when it comes to knockdown models, they are more vulnerable to attack, and models in melee against them receive a plus one die bonus on the attack goal roll. Now let's talk about ranged combat. Ranged combat occurs when a model attacks another model from a distance beyond base contact. In order to make a ranged attack, a model must have either a special trait that specifies it works at a distance or a ranged weapon. Models roll their ranged attack stat as the basis for the ranged attack. Defending models oppose attackers with their ranged defense stat. Be sure to factor in any bonus dice or rerolls from traits, gear or situational factors. If the attacker rolls more goals than the defender, the shot results in a hit and the difference between the goals scored on the attack check and the goals scored on the defense check equals the health loss inflicted by the attack. If the defender ties or gets more goals than the attacker, they have evaded the attack. Just as has been explained in the melee section, if you are playing solo, you will employ the combined role method to generate goal totals for your own models and any AI-controlled game models that you are facing. When it comes to ranged attacks in melee, unless a trait or special piece of gear dictates otherwise, you cannot use ranged attacks in melee. But when shooting into a melee, you can actually do that, but your shot may go awry and hit an unintended target. First, you declare your shot into the melee and make a ranged attack goal roll. Next, you use a single dice to randomize the melee participants assigning each an equal chance to be hit. Once you roll whom you actually targeted, that model can make its range defense check. Now concerning attack ranges, you measure the range between attacker and target before rolling any dice. Depending on the range, the attacker or defender's dice pools could be modified, and you use the same range chart for your intellect and will-based ranged combat exchanges. Now concerning seeing targets, a model must be able to see at least some part of its target to hit it with a ranged attack. The acting player should get down to the model's eye level. If the attacking model cannot draw a straight, uninterrupted line of sight to some part of its target, it may not fire. Friendly models do not block a shooter's line of sight, but enemy models do. And when it comes to cover, Farthest star counts two types of cover, hard and soft. Hard cover is any substance with stopping power like a starship's bulkhead, a cave wall, a cantina table. Soft cover is a less durable form of cover that might still spoil an attacker's aim or deflect a shot. So for example, maybe you count soft cover as foliage, bystanders or drapery. So obviously models in hard cover are going to get a greater bonus when compared to soft cover. As models in this game are thought to be in constant motion, a model need only be partially obscured by the cover to receive its full benefits. If even just a leg or an arm is obscured, the model is in cover. Now let's talk about stacking modifiers. Modifiers for ranged combat stack, so you're going to get a really good bonus to your ranged defense if you are pretty far away from your attacker and you are behind cover. Now concerning radius attacks, 
Certain ranged weapons, grenades and gases cover a wider area than normal. A radius attack affects a certain area in inches from the center of the original target, possibly affecting adjacent models. If even a portion of an adjacent model's base is touched by the radius attack, that model must also make an opposed defense roll against the same attack roll as the original target. So this represents all of those explosions and perhaps shrapnel and such. Now let's go deeper into the details of damage. Every model in this game has a health rating that tracks its overall condition and well-being. A model always begins every one-off battle at its peak health, usually 6, but model type, species and certain traits can affect this. Models involved in a campaign can sustain injuries that carry over from battle to battle. A model loses health to injuries from battle or its environment, most often whenever it takes a hit in combat. If you are using a character card like the one provided in the book, you mark health off by moving from left to right on the card's damage track. Health can never go negative. Once a character model hits zero health, their player needs not to record further damage. Now concerning environmental and other hazards, characters can also take damage from environmental hazards like heat, drowning and falling as well as weird effects from chemicals that could temporarily inhibit movement or actions. Rather than rolling dice for them, you have a static target number that players roll against. If they fail, they suffer the difference in damage as if they had been hit by an attack. You have different uh, hazards and conditions like burning, drowning, falling, poison and disease, uh, nerve gas. And now let's talk about knockout checks. When a character marks off their last box in the health track, this forces a knockout check or a KO check. So when a model has its last health box marked off, it must make a target number for fitness or will check, whichever is higher, to remain standing. If the model fails its check, you place it face down on the table where it last stood. Unless a comrade can apply a medkit or use some sort of trait to heal the fallen character, they are effectively out of the battle. If the model makes its KO check, it can remain standing and fight as normal. However, if it sustains any further health loss, it is knocked out with no further checks. The model is placed face down to await its fate. Characters who end the game knocked out must roll on the post-battle injury table to see what happens to them. Concerning out of action, knocked out models are at the mercy of their enemies. An enemy model in base contact with a knocked out foe can elect to spend its combat action and take the model out of action with a potentially killing blow that removes the model from the table. No roll is necessary as the knocked out model is utterly defenseless. Models removed from play due to this maneuver suffer a further minus one on their post battle checks for a total of 1d6 minus 2. A model that is in base contact with both a knocked out model and a fully functioning enemy model cannot take a helpless model out of action as it must fully concentrate on battling the more dangerous foe. Models may take a fallen foe out of action with a ranged attack by spending their combat action and making a target number 3 ranged attack goal roll. The knocked out model must be within range and line of sight. And there are many different maneuvers that you can carry out in combat. This makes this game a very tactical experience. You have things such as aim the shot, all out attack, charge, disarm, full defense, trip, and that is without counting the different traits and the weapons that you are wielding. So there are many options concerning what to do during each combat turn. Now let's talk more about playing solo or co-op games. When compared to other skirmish games, Farthest Star has the advantage of being played as either a traditional player versus player set of skirmish rules or as a solo and cooperative storytelling game. You will need to become familiar with the rules from the section concerning playing solo games to run those matches effectively of course. While there are many things to consider when running game based or artificial intelligence models, you will quickly internalize the rules after a few games that is they are quite easy to learn you can easily apply the necessary adjustments. While no set of written rules can anticipate every situation in a solo game, you can apply these rules and a little common sense 
to cover any situation or overcome any hang-ups or lulls in the action. That is, when a situation is not very clear, you can apply some common sense with the logic of the rules. Now, concerning game setup, you have four steps to set up a solo or co-op game. You select your crew, or you continue with an existing crew if playing a campaign. You pick a set scenario or device one of your own. This includes determining who you will be fighting against. You set up the terrain and models as per the scenario specifications. And you start your game with round one. Now concerning the balance, these rules assume you are playing with a crew based on four standard models or some variation of that array. If there is no scenario specifying your opposition, craft a group of foes roughly equal to your crew. That way you can easily play a game with more or less models, following the crew creation rules. Then you roll a d6 and you consult a table to adjust the enemy's power level. You use an AI game character's role as a guide to creating crews with balanced ability sets. For example, an AI crew of four standard characters that can cover a number of threats and situations might include commander, brawler, shooter, techno, if you wanted to further diversify the crew, you could downgrade the Techno to a minor status and add a minor psychic or a minor version of any other model role you have a good model to depict. And this is really cool because you never know what you are going to face in the different scenarios. Maybe you make your role and the enemy force gains an additional major character. Or maybe they get an additional minor character. Or maybe you get an ally. Perhaps it's a minor ally or a major character ally. And there are plenty of examples and tips on how to handle both solo and co-op games, and information on the different roles and guidelines for beastmasters, brawlers, commanders, lurkers, any sort of opposition or allies that could appear in a scenario. And when it comes to general rules, unless a scenario specifies otherwise, hostile AI characters will follow the guidance outlined in the previous sections. If the scenario features a primary objective, this could alter a model's basic behavior. The scenario may direct all or certain AI models to move towards a primary objective, either to guard it or secure it. If no enemy model is visible and the scenario lacks a primary objective for the AI model to focus on, you use the model's initiative card suit as a guide. So maybe the model charges towards the center of the board. Or maybe it moves logically and uses a trait ability. Or perhaps it moves and remains in open ground, very risky. And of course you have further information and details concerning the use of traits, free action traits, rerolls, targets and movement, gang ups, etc. And this concludes the review for today. In the next part we are going to talk about scenarios, campaigns, enemies, the role-playing game aspect of this skirmish game. We are going to talk about additional rules and I will give you my final thoughts on Farthest Star. Thank you for watching this part of the review and thank you so much to those of you that have been supporting the channel by sending drive through RPG gift certificates. If anyone else wants to further support the channel, the information on how to do that will be in the description below. Once again, thank you and see you later.